Hey booktube, it's Peg. Welcome back to the History Shelf um, to the first week of October. Uh, this video I'd like to show you some of the recent books I uh, acquired through my History Book Club that I belong to. Um, these were selections that I had credits for so I decided to use my credits on these really exciting new fall releases and in fact this is the most exciting time for me is the fall history releases. Um, there are so many that I will probably need to make a second video showing you some of the books I've gotten from publishers. Um, but these are the ones that I, I went ahead and purchased because I just had to have them. Um, in addition, I'm going to show you a few books that I, um, I purchased um, outside of the club just to complete my collection and then just a couple of books I've been wanting for a while. So, having said that, let's start with the History Book Club books that I picked up new fall releases. The first is this epic history on the Vikings. The uh, Children of Ash and Elm by Neil Price. And this is put out by Basic Books. Um, I had read, the most recent history book I've read on the Vikings was, um, it's called The Vikings. I was going to look up the author <laughs> before I started this video. Um, Hold, please. Uh, it was a decent history. Uh, who wrote it? It was... Or was it The Age of the Vikings by Anders Winroth? I think I read that one as well. Um, it might have been that one. No, it was The Vikings, A History by Robert Ferguson. And that came out in 2010. So obviously it's 10 years later and we need a new... Viking history to read. So I'm very excited for this one. We've got some color. We even got color uh, color pictures on the ins on the inside here. Um, I think the other one I had that is a classic is a history of the Vikings by um, oh God, what was his name? Can't I can see it right over there on the other bookshelf, but um. I read a book review on this uh, that was in the Wall Street Journal, and uh, they highly recommend. They said this was a really good read, um, a, a great history, uh, kind, of, kind of like a, it takes more of a global approach um, to the Vikings and just you know how they uh, their impact on history, and the regions that they came into contact with. Uh, talks about the making of Midgard, Viking phenomenon. New worlds and new nations. So um, it's about time to have a new uh, history on the Vikings. So I, I picked this one up. I'm very happy to to get that one. <laughs> okay, so let me do this really quick. Um, I have been told in no uncertain terms, you have enough Hitler biographies or Hitler books. Right. <laughs> but I'm a completionist, okay? So I had the first volume of this two-part two volume um, biography on Hitler. So I had to have volume two that just came out and this is Hitler Downfall 1939 to 1945 by Volker, Volker Ulrich. So uh, you know the other one is right behind me. I think you can see it. Ooh, right there. Ooh. So that's gonna go right there. Um, yeah Martine is not a fan. I really do believe in this so I can say definitively, now that I have this one, and I've got the, the, the Brendan Sims um, bio, I've got the, uh, was it Longnecker? Uh, yeah, right? Because Longnecker, he was, uh, uh, what do we got here? No, wait, am I thinking <laughs> a theologian? <laughs> um... It, long rich. Okay, sorry. There was a long necker and a long rich. Um, so I have that one. I've got the long rich biography. I've got the Brendan Sims. Of course, I read the Ian Kershaw ones ages ago. I'm, they're somewhere in, in storage, I'm sure. And then I have the Volker Ulrich on uh, two volume. So I am set. I really don't think anything more needs to be said about the man. Um, so I'm in agreement with Steve Donahue on that and along with many of you. Now, 
it doesn't mean I won't read like oh specialized topics that have to do with Hitler tangentially I think I have a, a book coming for possible review on Hitler's northern utopia and uh, just how he was trying to build his network in um, I believe Sweden and Norway and all that so that's interesting to me just from a broad historical perspective um, but as far as needing any more Hitler biographies I think I'm done I think this one will do it so Martine rest easy I think we've seen the last Hitler biography <laughs> cross the doorstep here um, the next book I got with my history book club credit is the Habsburgs. I've been wanting this one. Um, to Rule the World by Martin Rady. Uh, I haven't really been reading you the descriptions, but um, you know, I think you get the drift with the first two. <sighs> and this one, um, let's see here. It's it's about the ruling, you know, the ruling uh, family that just had such a outsized impact. Um, on the formation of you know modern Europe today I think you know it just it it, it, it had an impact that had long-reaching effects is what I'm trying to say um, I'll read a quick overview here for you from modest origins in the Middle Ages the Habsburgs built up a block of land in Austria and in the 15th century became Holy Roman emperors dominating much of Central Europe then in just a few decades after 1500 the Habsburgs burst upon the world by good fortune and crafty marriages, they took over a large part of Europe, uh, stretching from Hungary to Spain and Portugal, as well as large parts of the New World and outposts in the Far East. Even after the loss of their Spanish and overseas empire in 1700 and the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire in 1806, the Habsburgs continued to govern Central Europe through the First uh, World War. Often, uh, historians often depict the Habsburgs as leaders of a disorganized and dis disunited empire characterized by a patchwork of territories, a tangle of laws and privileges, and a medley of languages. But Rady reveals and explains their enduring power, which was driven by the belief that they were destined to rule the world as defenders of the Roman Catholic Church, guarantors of peace, and patrons of learning. Um, they're saying this is the definitive history of a dynasty that forever changed Europe and the world. So, that remains to be seen. But uh, I, I look forward to reading this. This is also by Basic Books. Oh, I needed to mention the Hitler, the Hitler biography. And this is out by Knopf. So, okay. Ooh, we've got a to big towering stack over here. All right. And so the other book I picked up with my History Book Club selections is this meaty work. Um, I love Middle Eastern history, uh, ancient as well as just modern and contemporary studies. And this is God's Shadow, Sultan Selim, um, His Ottoman Empire and the Making of the Modern World by Alan McHale. Uh, and this is put out, I believe, by Liberate. Liberate, yeah. Beautiful cover. I've seen this in other channels as well. Um, let's see, long neglected in world history, the Ottoman Empire was a hub of intellectual fervor, and we've heard that, this before from many other books, so that's something new. Uh, geopolitical power and enlightened pluralistic rule. Yes and no. Yes and no to that. Um, at the height of their authority in the 16th century, the Ottomans, with extraordinary military dominance and unparalleled monopolies over trade routes, controlled more territory and ruled over more people than any world power, forcing Europeans out of, the, out of the Mediterranean and to the New World. Yet, despite its towering influence and centrality to the rise of our modern world, the Ottoman Empire's history has for centuries been distorted, misrepresented, and even suppressed in the West. Now, Alan McHale presents a vitally needed recasting of Ottoman history, retelling the story of the Ottoman conquest of the world through the dramatic biography of Sultan Selim I, 1470 to 1520. Um, mm -hmm. Let me skip down here. Drawing on previously unexamined sources from multiple languages and with original maps and stunning illustrations, Mikhail's game-changing account, wow, okay, it's really setting itself up to be something here, uh, challenges readers to recalibrate their sense of history, according to Leslie Pierce, I don't know who that is, uh, adroitly using Salim's life to upend prevailing shibboleths about Islamic history and jingoistic, quote, rise of the West, 
unquote theories that have held sway for decades. All right. Well, we'll, we'll take, we'll see. We'll see how this uh, tries to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. mm, this is going to be interesting. I like books that make an argument and sometimes uh, controversial ones or trying to rewrite or claim that a prevailing um, historical narrative is incorrect um, and then tries to prove that. I, I, I enjoy reading that. Whether I'll agree with it or not is meant is is yet to be seen but i will read this uh with an open mind and, and ready to be to to be swayed but it really is a mixed record on the ottoman empire's enlightened rule um that that's like i said yes and no in certain places yes in certain places uh, that's a big resounding no so got shadow okay so the final book from my history book club uh, selections. This looked like a, a fun read, and I, I have—I think I have a couple of other books by this author. Uh, if anything, I know I've read some, several of his articles on the BBC History Magazine. I think um, I've seen his name everywhere. Anyway, this is *The City on the Thames: <clears throat> The Creation of a World Capital: a History of London* by Simon Jenkins. And this is just a beautiful book, as you can see. Um, and this is put out by, looks like Pegasus Books. Um, it's beautiful color map, ancient like and London map, inserts on both end papers, which Simon Jenkins. Yes, this is by Pegasus. And these are all new books that have come out in the last month or so. Um, and this is, yeah, Simon Jenkins, he was the former editor of London Times. And it's a vivid, evocative, and deeply knowledgeable history of this unique world capital. London, a settlement founded by the Romans, occupied by the Saxons, conquered by the Danes, and ruled by the Normans. This transformative place became a medieval maze of alleys and courtyards, later to be checkered with grand estates of Georgian splendor. It swelled with industry and became the center of the largest empire in history. And having risen from the rubble of the Blitz, it is now one of the greatest cities in the world. From the prehistoric occupants of the Thames Valley to the pre preoccupied commuters of today, Simon Jenkins brings together the key events, individuals, and trends in London's history to create a matchless portrait of the capital. He masterfully explains the battles that determined how London was conceived and built, and especially the perennial conflict between money and power. Uh, based in part on his experiences of and involvement in the events that shaped the post-war city, uh, and with his trademark color and authority, Simon Jenkins shows above all how London has taken shape over more than 2,000 years. Um, this is narrative history at its finest from the most ardent protector of British heritage. Okay. Yeah, Simon Jenkins, he's written a lot of different things here. Um, short history of Europe, short history of England. Um... Oh, he wrote The Battle for the Falklands with Max Hastings, um, Thatcher and Sons. He wrote a book on Wales, England's cathedrals. So, yeah. I thought this would be a fun little read uh, just, just to explore the, just the history of a city. And uh, I haven't read a big, um, you know, city bio. I guess you saw a city biography in a long time. And, um, yeah, I'd like to know more about this, uh, The Great Fire of London right there we got Samuel Pepys so it's just gonna be a fun overview kind of a survey um, for prehistoric pre times to modern times so brand new release City on the Thames by Simon Jenkins so these were my as I said my history book club selections they're quite a heavy stack but I've already cleared some space on my bookshelves so now to some other books I just wanted to kind of round out my library uh, first, this is a shout out to Andrew B. I normally would not have bought this book, but after your wonderful series on the uh, conditions of the working class in England by uh, Friedrich Engels, I decided to give it a try because I am interested, to, at least <laughs> for the parts where he describes the actual working conditions and the utter poverty that people lived in, and just you know, to give you to give me more of a sense of. Uh, you know, indeed, the, the, the conditions that people lived in and just to, you know, kind of remember that um, this has always 
been a, a aspect of history is that you know there are the haves and the have-nots right so I decided to pick up <laughs> God help me uh, angles of all people um, not a big fan of Marx or angles or any of that crowd but um, you know I've read their works or some of their works I've tried to get through some of their works and they're so turgid but anyway this one sounds like it might be somewhat readable uh, Friedrich Engels the conditions of the working class in England I picked up the Oxford World's classics uh, just the, it was the most affordable I, I tried to find the the really beautiful hardcover that Andrew B you had but uh, yeah any used copies were hundreds of dollars for those so I had to go with you know economy uh, something that wouldn't break the budget and then I can at least you know peruse this so this is all because of Andrew B and my learning continues apace um, he's got a great new video up on the wig interpretation of history you can only get this kind of content at Andrew B's channel uh, I'll link him below because he's a he's a stellar he's one of the rock stars little known rock stars on booktube I think um, that's the kind of that's the kind of videos I enjoy watching you know I just obscure arcane titles and then Andrew just discoursing on it and then it takes me down a rabbit hole of further research and it just it lights up my brain so thanks to Andrew B I picked up angles um, and then this is book this book is just you know I love reading about different countries right and uh, their histories but also their current you know their modern struggles with coming up out of their past um, you know their third world status um, how they're rebuilding society and I've always been intrigued by um, Southeast Asia and uh, obviously I've been reading quite a bit lately on Vietnam whether through memoirs history and uh, historical fiction um, but I wanted to know more about Cambodia this has been in my cart for a very long time and I just you know decided one day I'm just gonna finally pick it up and it's just, I just ordered it off of Amazon but this is Joel Brinkley's Cambodia's Curse um, the modern history of a troubled land look at that cover Ugh. Wow um, by Paul Grave Macmillan so I'll just read this real quick to you 30 years after reporting on the fall of the Khmer Rouge uh, Joel Brinkley returned to find the Cambodian people still among the most abused in the world. They suffer in the grip of a venal government that refuses to provide even the most basic services without a bribe. The bulk of the populace lives just as Cam Cambodians did a thousand years ago, while government officials divert unimaginable sums into their own pockets. Meanwhile, half of those who lived through the Khmer Rouge era still suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder today, uh, and this affliction is being passed to the next generation darkening the entire nation's personality. A riveting narrative of the willful mismanagement of a country, Cambodia's curse draws from rich, in-depth reporting to illuminate the real Cambodia, its people, and the deep historical roots to its present-day plight. Um, so that's what drew me to it as well, was um, it's, it's like a niche interest of mine, <sighs> post-traumatic distress uh, disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know in the early wars they called it shell shock but obviously PTSD is a real um, a real phenomenon and it, it it can happen just like survivors have it obviously you don't have to be fighting in a war you could just be near to a violent event or witness a violent event or have survived a violent event and you can have that and the fact that in this book he's claiming it has affected an entire generation um, and the Khmer Rouge was um, on a level of evil that you know if you've seen the Tower of Skulls I think that um, um, there's a famous picture of the Tower of Skulls that was kind of built <clears throat> from all of the um, just the genocide the slaughter of um, people because they were seen as enemies of the, the Khmer Rouge regime and um, you know there's yeah when you've seen that and lived through that type of evil on a scale that would just basically probably numb 
most of us to, or at least just turn you into a zombie. Um, it's fascinating to me, like how the human being deals with that. So post-traumatic um, stress disorder is a niche interest of mine and to see it applied to a national level. And then he says that it's being passed on, that, that dark sense of just, uh, you know, a sense of uh, affliction. Um, it's being passed on to the next generation. That is alarming and sad. So I just wanted to know more about the people of Cambodia and that country and what's going on there. And hopefully, hopefully at some point they can get new government. It's not corrupt and doesn't care about them. Okay, well, I was hoping we could end on a happier note. It's my new shirt by uh, Don't Take Me to Your Leader. <laughs> it's from Headline T-shirts, by the way. Um, they are not a sponsor of this channel, but they could be. I have several T-shirts by them, and they're really fun. Anyway. Just try to lighten things up a bit. Anyway, so I decided to round out my um, collection of Henry Kamen works. Um, I have, he's, a, he's written extensively on Spain, and I've been building up my Spanish history. Uh, in fact, I've, I have a few more books coming. I have a few more books coming from Hamilton book, I think. Um, to round out my other like studies on Spain. I recently read a book or two on the Spanish Civil War. One was fiction, one was kind of like a nonfiction memoir, and it made me really interested to know more because um, that was one area of history I didn't know a lot about. I mean, I knew the gist, the, the, the communist Republicans against Franco's fascists and, and all that stuff, but these other two books I read really kind of um, pulled the curtain back a little bit more on that that uh, civil war and just how brutal it was and I'm learning that and I wanted to know more but anyway uh, Henry came in uh, you know he's one of the um, he's one of the many um, scholars that you know has written extensively on Spain and different different time periods obviously not just Spanish civil, civil war but um, so I've been building a library is what I'm trying to say is that I've become interested in Spain and knowing more about that country and its history in particular so the book that I already owned by Henry Kamen um, is his it's the fourth edition of the Spanish Inquisition, a historical revision. Um, and I've been wanting this one for a while. This is out by Yale University Press. So this is one of the ones that is on my book bookshelf. You just haven't seen, I haven't talked about it yet. Um, so I'll just give you you're probably wondering, what is this, a historical revision? He's basically saying um, that it wasn't as bad as people said it was. I mean, it's, it was bad, but um, it wasn't on the level of, like, uh, the Crusades, you know, as far as death goes or, um, you know, uh, the numbers were inflated, I think is what he's, he was saying. But let me just give you, um, I'll read what the back of the book says here. In this completely updated edition of Henry Kamen's classic survey of the Spanish Inquisition, the author incorporates the latest research in multiple languages to offer a new and thought-provoking view of this fascinating period. Kamen sets the notorious Christian tribunal into the broader context of Islamic and Jewish culture in the Mediterranean, reassesses its consequences for Jewish culture, measures its impact on Spain's intellectual life, and firmly rebuts a, a variety of myths and exaggerations that have distorted, distorted understandings of the Inquisition. He concludes with disturbing reflections on the impact of state security organizations in our own time. So uh, this is the one I have, and um, you know maybe this might be uh, something down the road here I could do a more in-depth video on if anyone's interested. Um, but I decided, I, I saw he had other works on Spanish history, and I was just like, you know what, I, I like I like his scholarship, and uh, so I got a couple of books, and I got them used. One of them is a little bit more beat up than the other, but they're serviceable editions. I can work with it. Um, so let's start with, oh, I, I hope these aren't the same books, but just by different titles. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a hoot and a holler? This came out in 2003. They, they, they seem to cover the, the same... Oh, I might have a duplicate. Same... 
one moment. Let me just make sure I'm not showing you duplicate books. Nope, these are different books. Fabulous, but you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. So the first one is Empire, How Spain Became a World Power, 1492 to 1763. That's by Harper Collins. This book came out in 2003, I believe. Yes, this is the first American. This is the first American edition. Um, ba 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 ba. Oh, it was originally published as Spain's Road to Empire um, in 2002. It was first published in Great Britain. Okay, but this is the American version. Um, subtitle speaks for itself. Uh, Spain became a world power. And then this one looked really great. Um, so this is his The Disinherited Exile and the Making of Spanish Culture, 1492 to 1975. Okay, so that's, yeah, I see where I got confused. All right, and uh, again, see, this is a used book. I need to try to clean this off. Uh, these are also put out by Harper. This one came out in um, 2000, uh, 2007. This is the first U.S. edition, but it was also published in Great Britain in, two, in 2007. Um, so this one takes some more of a cultural um, uh, look at Spain's history, and um, he's just a great writer and a historian. And I wanted to to have more of his work, especially as it is around Spain. So now I have three of Henry Kamen's works. So, all right. So a 26 minute, 27 minute video, not too bad. So, you know, I got a, a, quite a few things here. Let me know what you guys think, if anything is appealing to you. Um, I look forward to uh, tapping into some of these history um, fall releases this fall. <laughs> um, I have some book reviews that are due by the end of the month. And then, then it will be moving into November and December. But, um, you know, let's face it, not going anywhere anytime soon especially with if you still have smoke in the air um, between if I'm not working or doing errands and cleaning the house and just talking to my partner watching a movie I'm reading I've got my nose in a book so um, and writing writing book reviews so anyway guys I've got quite a lot to keep me busy I will have another video very soon to show you some more new releases that have come out um, several of them from publishers um, for uh, uh, review and or possible review and uh, I'm only one person I'm doing the best I can I'm trying to read everything I can get my greedy little mitts on uh, <laughs> but anyway I'll stop short for right now let me know what you think of these books if you have any you guys are always have something interesting to share so I'm always happy to hear from you guys so until next time take care and uh, you know, stay safe and stay healthy. And don't take me to your leader. All right. On that note, guys, have a good one. Talk soon. Bye.